Welcome to the podcast, everybody. Thank you all for tuning in. Um, I want to start by thanking my sponsor, uh, Defense Soap. They have uh, been awesome. I've used their products ever since I started grappling. Um, their soaps and all their products have essential oils in them that have been proven to be antifungal and antibacterial. And they're all natural, which I love. I don't, I don't want to put any kind of uh, stuff on my skin that may be detrimental or uh, has some kind of effects I may not know. So their products are all natural. They've worked effectively and really well for me throughout the years. Um, I love using their soaps after training. I also use uh, one of my favorite things is their wipes. They have these defense wipes that I use after uh, I get done training. If I can't get to a shower right away, um, I use that, and it really is uh, helps keep my skin clean and healthy. Uh, so, guys, make sure to check out Defense Soap, D E F E N S E S O A P dot com. It's Defense Soap dot com. Uh, check them out. Pick up some of their stuff. It's really, really good stuff. Um, also, guys, I'm excited to announce that. I have just recently opened my own physical therapy clinic. Uh, it's my own private clinic. It's here in Louisville, Kentucky. It's called Proform Physical Therapy. And I uh, see a lot of jujitsu practitioners, CrossFit athletes, um, your everyday injuries, shoulders, necks, backs, anything you got that's keeping you off the mats or just keeping you from doing the things you love. So guys, Proform Physical Therapy, it's proformrehab.com. P-R-O-F-O-R-M. You know, if you guys need anything, if you're in the Louisville area um, and you need some help getting over some injuries, reach out to me. I'd love to help you guys out. So again, that's proformrehab.com. And my guest today for the 47th episode of the Jiu-Jitsu Therapist Podcast is Clay Mayfield. Uh, Clay is a Jiu-Jitsu brown belt and a Judo black belt. Um, he is, lives out of Paducah, Kentucky, but he trains in Illinois at IQ Jiu-Jitsu, and uh, he's been training for a long time. He is an avid competitor. Started out at a, at a gym where he didn't really compete, and competition was not a big emphasis, and he decided that um, he wanted to compete more in Jiu-Jitsu. So we talk about his process of changing gyms and um turning jiu-jitsu truly into his lifestyle he uh, is now uh, traveling the world and competing in jiu-jitsu as well as uh, running seminars i really enjoyed this podcast with clay i mean it was just awesome to see someone that uh, has a passion found his passion and wanted to live that to the fullest and and make that his lifestyle and uh, you know his love for jiu-jitsu is evident and he was able to you know combine that with his love for traveling and make this what he does for a living which is something we all strive for i think to do something we love so it was awesome to see how it came about and how clay um made this happen for himself so um thank you guys uh for tuning in and thank you to clay for coming on and um hope you all enjoy the podcast yeah, so um clay th thanks for coming on i uh, appreciate you coming on the podcast oh thanks for having me yeah uh so uh, where are you uh, based out of where's uh where are you training so right now I live in Paducah, Kentucky, and I train a little north uh, up in southern Illinois. Okay. Um, I'm out of a school called uh, IQ Jiu-Jitsu uh, under Jared Jessup, and then I, I also cross-train with a, a school in Mount Vernon called Pedigo Submission Fighting um, under Heath Pedigo. So uh, most of my training is at those two schools. And then I also, uh, since I live an hour away from, from those academies, I have some mats in my garage, and, and I train here a couple days a week and, you know, in the mornings and go up. To Illinois in the afternoons. Okay, so you how so you, is uh, where's your home base at? Is it in Paducah? No, my home base is, is IQ, which is up in Southern Illinois. Southern I, Illinois. I started jujitsu in Paducah years ago, and then uh, I switched schools, but I still live in Paducah, so it's been a bit of a commute. Gotcha. What was the what was the reason for like switching? I mean, is there anything in, in particular? Yeah, um, the school just had to. Um, different goals than, than what I'm hoping to accomplish. I, gotcha. I came up and, and we didn't do anything competition oriented or, gotcha. or even, even any advanced jiu-jitsu. I didn't know anything about spider guard or, you know, uh, anything remotely advanced. And so when I got interested in competing around purple belt level, I, I was getting my butt kicked by, you know, white belts that knew how to compete. And so I, Looked around, you know, cross trained a few gyms, kind of switched schools to align myself with those goals, wanted to compete more, and, and um, wanted to shake up my training environment a little bit. 
Yeah. So, uh, what got you interested in jujitsu? Oh uh, well, I moved around a lot growing up, and uh, my dad was in medical school, so we we moved. I was born in Dallas, and then we moved to the Caribbean and Belize. Moved to England, lived over there, and then all around the states in his residency. And he always talked about martial arts. He he had done taekwondo when he was younger, and uh, you know we watched all the, the Steven Seagal and Jackie Chan movies and all that, and it always looked really cool. And when he settled in Kentucky found a jiu-jitsu academy and we went over there to give it a try and so that was my initial step into jiu-jitsu i was 15 at the time and i hated it <laughs> uh i it wasn't what i thought it would be you know it was on the ground it was weird and, and i wanted to be like jackie chan and so i had some preconceived notions but it turned out to be a great thing after a few months i enjoyed it a little more a little more and you know how it sucked people in Sure. What what turned you on to it? What was like the the turning point? Was there something that 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 you did? Was it like getting a submission? Was it like winning a tournament? I don't remember in particular, to be honest. I think it um, it was just when I broke through that glass ceiling of like what my expectations were of martial arts, and I yeah. saw what it really was. Then it became fun. Uh, I do distinctly remember the first time I I caught a submission when I was rolling, or at least the first time that it sunk in. Right. Uh, one of my training partners was uh, was going for a stacking guard pass, and I realized that he was in, putting himself in a triangle position. And I locked in the triangle and, and caught it, and, and it was kind of like an aha moment, and yeah. try kind of been my specialty ever since. Um, so that was an early memory that stuck with me. Yeah, I I I would have to say mine was would be the same thing. I probably started while well, I was twenty five when I started. Same thing, you know, you're just trying to figure out what the hell you're doing, and then. Yeah. Somebody gets, you know, it was another white belt, and he got on top, and you hit the triangle, you're like, holy shit. Like, number yeah. one, it, I did it. Number two, it, it works. Uh, you know, you always, like, I did a little Taekwondo, like, very little when I was younger, and I was like, how is this applicable? You know, how can I actually do this? Like, am I going to be able to do this in a situation where it requires, you know, me defending or, or anything like that? But in jiu-jitsu, it's like, here's the move. You put it in action. And it, it works. You can actually, you know, learn techniques, apply them, and and see them be successful, which I think is a, a huge thing in jujitsu. You know, you can actually see them work. Yeah, I I've, I've done very little bit of like a kung fu in, in England and a little kickboxing Muay Thai when I was uh, maybe thirteen or fourteen. Mm -hmm. But jujitsu is different because you know you couldn't really spar with those. I mean, you could put on the gloves, yeah, but at least. Yeah. In, at least in, in, in the environments that I was at, you know, we didn't really spar or, or beat each other up, and so you couldn't really see. It was all just pretending, you know? Right. Uh, and, and and you're right. When you go to jiu-jitsu, the rubber meets the road, and you really get to see this, this works or doesn't work, and the buck stops there. Yeah. Well, what about, like, so a after, you know, training for a while, what, what about competition kind of inspired you or intrigued you? What, what was that? Did you just kind of put yourself out there and just weren't successful, or what, what was kind of the thing for you? Well, um, I was kind of a late bloomer there. I didn't do my first competition until I was a uh, blue belt. Um, actually, like right before I got my purple belt, I did two tournaments as a blue belt. And uh, the first match I ever did, I was I think I was 17, and I, I you know I thought I was gonna go clean house, and uh, I got my arm popped in the first match, and then I got almost choked out in my second match. I mean, I just got the floor mocked at me, and uh, I loved it though. It was really fun. And so I did another one, and same kind of thing. I hypersented the other arm in the next one. But it was <laughs> it was so much fun. And so then I got my pearl belt. I started doing a few more. And, and I, I was doing those, um, do you remember Elio Sanakas? Yeah, yeah, I did one of those. And then uh, and then the core, it was the core grappling challenge. Actually, right here, the first tournament I ever did. All right, where was that uh, basketball academy? When, I don't know. I don't think I did that one. The first one I did was I did an ego. That was my first tournament, and then I did do my second one was the Seneca tournament. Okay. Uh, I got, I got beat up, pretty bad. <laughs> I didn't actually first. I remember my first match. I had one match in Gi. I ended up losing on advantage because I the guy was in my guard and I didn't do anything. Second match, or then I did Nogi and I had a wrestler and this dude just like, it was funny because right before the match in Nogi he's like. He's talking to the ref, and he's not even looking at me. He's like, hey, uh, can I help go and move up a division? When he was talking like that, I was like, this is going to suck for me. He, <laughs> you know, short guy, stocky, cauliflower ears. Like, 
You're like, all right. He's like, yeah, is there anywhere I can move up? And it was like, they're like, no, it's too late notice, blah, blah, blah. I mean, he was, I think, new uh, new to jiu-jitsu, but he was a wrestler and pretty good wrestler at that. And I had no wrestling background, so he pretty much just yeah. basically got on top of me and just, just rode me out, you know, for, for the duration. I didn't get submitted, at least, but shit, it's not fun to be on top of, uh, you know, on the bottom of a wrestler, for sure. No, it's not. <laughs> So, um, is there, uh, you know, we can kind of get into this now, but like, is there a tournament, uh, rule set that you like? Is there one, I mean, I know probably when we first started similar, we probably started around the same time as far as training goes, you know, there's more traditional kind of IBJJF rules. Now you've got all these other rules coming out, um, you know, with EBI rules and, and kind of, you know, Abu Dhabi obviously has been around forever. W what kind of rule set do you like or do you prefer? Sure. So we were talking about the first couple of tournaments being those like those core grappling and then the blue rafts round robins and right. those tournaments. So the way I kind of um, came up competing was in those smaller tournaments and I always I liked the sub only better. And I did like Gracie Worlds and Gracie Nationals and you know the, the, the bigger sub only ones. And for a long time I, I identified with like being a guy that only did sub only or, you know, had always trying to submit and I, I'm just, you know, I still always go for the submission, but I stayed away from IBJJF tournaments for like nine years or eight years. I, I started training in August of 2008, so almost 10 years now. I think I'm the same time you did. I think I started at the same time. Yeah. I think it was a little earlier. Maybe it was like July or something of 2008. Awesome. That's very cool. Or seven, something like that. So, yeah, like, for, for the first eight years, I didn't do any IBCJF tournaments. I always say, well, no, I, I just sub only. I don't want to win by points. And, you know, I have my bullshit excuses. Yeah. Then when I, when I got to be, like, a brown belt, I realized, I mean, all the best in the world are there. You'll never fight the best in the world doing, like, a, a fight to win pro or an AGF, you know, or it's where those tournaments are. You're not going to, you're not going to fight Mauricio Gomez there. And so... I did my first IBJJF like 13 months ago, and uh, it's really hard trying to enter that skill set as a brown belt. Mm -hmm. Fighting guys that have been doing that since they were white belts, you know, all the Octos and AOJ kids. You know, sure, that, yeah. Um, fighting this rule set since birth, basically. Um, but I prefer the IBJJF rule set. Uh, I like the sub only. I still I've won like 98% of my matches by submission, so I don't. I, I'm not a, like a staller point guy personally but the fact of the matter is you know if the, the points can be abused in my opinion like neon belly or you know maybe stalling it, it can be abused but by and large the points reflect who's dominating the match position and if you can pass someone's guard and mount them and take their back even if the time runs out before you catch the submission you should win because you dominated them right right yeah that's I'm just a few cents um so my favorite i mean i, I like the EBI rules a lot how there's always a definitive winner um, but personally, I, I like the IBJF time set the best. Mm -hmm. And you just got, uh, you just competed at Worlds? I did. My first time at Worlds in Pans this year. Well, what was that like? I, I, I did the Master Worlds a couple of years ago, man, and the environment was incredible. Uh, yeah. Just to see, like, like you said, just like the absolute biggest names in Jiu-Jitsu, like people, you've read their books, you've seen them on, you know, YouTube, whatever, you know, just the... Andre Galvao is walking around coaching because he's got, you know, so many so many kids yeah. out there and so many, you know, competitors out there. Like, what was that like for you being in that in that environment? It was awesome. Um, like you said, the energy in the pyramid is just, you know, it's hard to describe. you got uh, Octos on one side and GFT on the other, and they're chanting back and forth. You know, it's it's uh, everyone you can imagine is there. It's, it's really hard to uh, – well, you can't find it anywhere else. So – it was probably the best competition experience I've ever had. Um, just being at that caliber of event, yeah. I really enjoyed it. And you know, you you go to any AGF and, and or AGF, you go to any IBCGF and it, even the the small opens like the Chicago Open or Atlanta, and it's ten times bigger than any other tournament. You, yeah. You know, you, I, the first one I did was the Atlanta Open last year. I think it was the Atlanta Spring Open, and. I step on the my mat to compete, and Keenan Cornelius is right next to me on the other mat. So, you know, it's... It's incredible, man. Awesome. Yeah, yeah I've done... Uh, well, they're a lot more prevalent now, too, as well, which is nice, because you know, they got one coming up in, in Nashville. Yeah. Uh, you know, they had one in Cincinnati. I competed at that one. There was a Charlotte Open. I competed in that one. 
And, uh, yeah, I mean, sometimes you'll go in and you lose one, you're done, or, you know, but it's, uh, yeah, I can see how the rule sets can definitely be abused, though. You know, like I had one match where a guy just pulled guard on me and he wouldn't open up at all, and he just was taking my collar, I fight him off, and, you know, six minutes or however long it was goes by and they give him the win. I'm like, you know, I'm trying to pass, I'm trying to open guard, the guy's just, you know, holding me down, so... Yeah, I, I think that you can, in, in that rule set, I feel like you can possibly play off your back more and, and get the victory more easily. You know, obviously if the person's not, you know, passing your guard. If you hold them in guard, I think the person on bottom they see is the aggressor. Yeah, and I'm not person that guard holder. I'm, I'm a or sorry, but, uh, you know, I, I'm a takedown guy, so I wish... If I can make any changes to the side rule set, one of them would be no jumping guard. I think it's incredibly dangerous. Um, and I would penalize the guard pull at, at least one point, maybe maybe a full takedown, two points for the guy who's sitting. Um, if, you, if you have a really strong guard game and you prefer to pull and work your guard, I, mean, I think you should be able to do that. But I think the other guy should take down points. Right. No, that makes sense. But I, yeah, I don't see I don't see any of that happening. You know, they're they're pretty they're pretty stringent on their rule. Like not even stringent because I think sometimes they don't even know the rules are, are kind of left to the interpretation of the uh, of the official. Which yeah, uh, I didn't. I, I noticed some, there was some stuff going on about Keenan's match in the worlds. Um, I didn't read too much about it, but I know there was something like he should have won, or they didn't give him the uh, points for a pass, something like that. Um, it seemed pretty flaky. Um, I mean, it is up to the interpretation of the ref, so yeah. you know, can't argue with it too much. But I saw the video, and it and it, it looked like Keenan was up an advantage, mm -hmm. and then very end, the guy sat back for an ankle lock, and it I mean, it wasn't even close, and they gave the guy an advantage, and then so they were tied in front of That's right. That's crazy. Um, so I mean, I'm sure Keenan's had the, the rough decision sway in his favor in the past. So, you know, you kind of got to accept the rules that you want to compete under and just go for whatever, except whatever comes with that part and parcel. But right. it did seem like he got robbed a little bit, but what are you going to do? So um, for you, what, what was the, uh, as far as the atmosphere, you know, we talked about that. What was the, like, nerves? Do you have any nerves going in? I mean, you, you compete. Um, you said you compete, you know, on a, you know, consistently – um, what, what was the nerves like or the preparation like for, um, for one of those tournaments? So, uh, preparation, I do a lot of drilling. Um, I, the way I personally look at training, I kind of view it as three different categories. The first category would be like your slow technical work where you learn how to do the moves, learn the steps. Mm -hmm. The second drilling where you take a move, you know, and you just get hundreds and hundreds of reps on it. And then the third is the rolling, and, um, positional sparring. And I try to, I recommend to my students that they divide their training up into like 30%, 30%, 30%. Um, because some people come in and all they want to do is roll and they don't know how to do the moves. And some people just come in and like do the slow moves and they don't know how to get the reps. So I focus a lot on, on drilling and, um, you know, we'll, we'll take the guard pass 100 times, 200, 300 times until we get hundreds or thousands of reps. And then uh, from there we'll do positional sparring. So... I guess a training session for me would look something like this. Um, maybe 30 or 45 minutes of drilling. Say if it's, if it's guard passing, we might do one or two or three guard passes and then chain them together and go uh, two minute sets back and forth or something like that. And then after 30 or 45 minutes of drilling like that, we'll do positional sparring like guard top and bottom, first one to points, so sweep or pass, mm -hmm. um, the pass submit. And then in the you know, in the last 15 or 20 minutes, we might open it up and do rounds from standing. So usually like a drilling, positional sparring, and then just three rounds. So you Something. maybe teach a, teach a movement, you know, get that movement more, like set yourself up, to, you know, say it's, you know, half guard, you know, dr passing or whatever it is, work on that. Then you set up, you know, pass defend drills from that, you know, or pass and defend, you know, positional rolling from there, and then you do full on rolling. Yeah, yeah, something along those lines. Yeah, I think that's a great way. Um, that's a great way to kind of cement it, or, or try because a lot of times you know what happens is if you learn a movement, and then it's like all right, full rolling, you're you're gonna go back to what you were doing before. You're gonna go back to your knee shield or Z guard or, or full guard, whatever you were doing before. You're not gonna work 
You know, there's, yeah. there's no way to, in, you know, and I think us being myself personally, I'm having a little less time to be training and, uh, you know, being an upper belt, you start to kind of like, you're kind of set in your game and some of it's harder to, you know, to play around, you, you know, mm-hmm. if you don't have the, the time, you know, that, that you need. So, yeah. And like, if you're, let's say we're doing arm, arm lock escapes in class. And so you learn an arm lock escape and then you just go straight to rolling. You may never be in that arm lock position your entire roll. Yeah. But if you, 10 minutes of, you know, uh, starting arm lock position, switch top to bottom after you escape or submit, then you're putting yourself in that position over and over. And so you're, you make sure with that kind of positional sparring that you're experiencing an opportunity to use what you were just drilling. Right. How about, like, would you guys do a lot of leg locks? Do you have uh, any, um, you know, every school's a little bit different. You know, obviously, I, I'm I'm of the opinion that everybody should learn them at least know uh, at every level. You know, I, I think you know, obviously, it's got to be more controlled, more for white belts and things like that. But I think it's good for everyone to know leg locks. How, how do you feel? Have you integrated that in your game more? Um, how do you feel about leg lock game and um, adding that into into your kind of regular game? Absolutely. Um, do you know who Joe Bates is? Yeah, absolutely. I know Joe. Joe, uh, Joe and I competed against her a couple times, and yes. he looked at me real fast once. <laughs> I think it was uh, Fight to Win. Were you, uh, were you, like, yeah, were you like a late replacement or something like that? Is that correct? Yes. He went from, uh, uh, yeah, they called me, the I think, the night before and said his guy dropped out and asked right. if I could jump. Right. And he called me in an inside hill looking within 60 seconds. Right. And uh, after that, he was gracious enough to invite me up to a school and, yeah. and cross train and he kind of mentored me for a few months on leg locks and really expanded that part of my game. Yeah. And then my, my instructor, Jared Jessup has got a pretty strong straight angle lock. So between the two of them, I've, uh, I've went on a leg lock during the last maybe 18 months and integrated into my game more more than it was. It's like Dan Hurst says, it's 40% of the body. I think it's yeah. and options from there, but people fear what they don't know. And, you know, most of the taps you get from hill hooks aren't from the hill because people are scared and they don't, you know, they don't want to work out of it or, or whatnot. So when you really understand the leg locks, it's just like a Kimura or any other submission. It's right. not really scary. You just have to know where you're safe and where you're not. Right. So I show, you know, I show my white belts, white belts or blue belts, you know, as they get up there, I show them the ankle locks, the hill hooks, all, all the submissions and just, you know, give them words of caution to, so they know how to use it right. Right. I'd rather someone be using heel hooks and understanding the leg positions at white belt than, than waiting until brown belt and then trying to use them, you know, when they can use them in tournaments. Right. Cause then, then they're playing six or eight years of catch up. Yeah. I've had, uh, I've had Joe actually, he's been on a podcast twice with me and, really? uh, yeah, Joe's, um, Joe's one of the, probably one of the nicest guys. Uh, and I did get a chance to roll with them and it was like, how, what, what is he doing? Like, how is he? It's like, yeah. I know what you're going to do. And, and he, he's like, yeah, I know. And he just does it. It's like, it gets, it, it's just the, the way like some of these leg lock guys can roll underneath you. Yeah. And you're like, I'm getting my weight back. You know, I'm, I'm getting down and it's just still just move you, just move you. And it's just so, if, when he rolls, it's so effortless, but he is, he's one of those guys, man. He's got to be one of the nicest guys in jiu-jitsu. And he's been around forever you know he's been training forever you hear that name when i started training 10 years ago you you knew the name joe bays you just did yeah, yeah i love joe and probably my favorite thing about him is trying to listen to the trash talk because he, he he doesn't do that like the most polite way you know so, <laughs> and I'm, I'm not trying to pick on joe no, so, no he's great he, uh you know whenever he's he's throwing a challenge out there or something he's just so nice about it <laughs> well yeah and uh I think when you're a nice guy in jiu-jitsu, sometimes you don't get the attention that some of these other guys. And I know we've talked about, me and him have talked about, like, not uh, what he doesn't like about jiu-jitsu. I don't want to speak for him, but, like, for the the gist that I got was that, you know, he's not a big fan of trash talking. He's like, look, let's just, you know, see who's better. Let, let's not, yeah. you know, let's not do anything, you know, to damage reputation. But, but he, yeah, I think he, he, he will compete with anybody. He's extremely talented. Um, he's fun to and watch. Because you're right, guys like Gordon Ryan get a lot of attention because they have big mouths. And I, I like Gordon a lot too. He's just a phenomenal athlete. But absolutely, you shouldn't have to to be a Conor McGregor to get attention in jiu-jitsu, You know? Sure, but 
you know, I guess that's look at look at MMA. I don't know if you follow MMA much, uh, UFC and all that, but that that's what you know. That's kind of the blueprint. Conor it's McGregor is. What what's that? What sells? Yeah, yeah, and I think honestly, uh, my favorite trash mm-hmm. talker is probably a Chael Sonnen. <laughs> he's the best. He's fun. He's Thank hilarious. You. He's just. He's witty, and Connor's great too. But you know, I think Chael started it all. He was awesome. Um, yeah. But um, so yeah, I remember you in that in that fight to win. I think uh, it was in was it in Nashville. Mm-hmm. Did you do commentary for that show as well? I did. I did commentary, and I had a game match. And yeah. Then, uh, go. So what was it like? How did how did you get into commentary, and what was that like to to do commentary on on different matches? It was awesome. I, I really enjoy that. Um, I mean, you know how it is being a jiu-jitsu nerd. You know, that's all you think about it anyway. Sure. And it's, it was cool being able to just uh, watch the matches live and talk about them and, and give that commentary. I enjoyed it. And it also kept my mind off of the, the upcoming match. You were you were talking about or asking about getting nervous before competing. Sure. I don't get nervous anymore, but up until about a year ago, I got really bad nerves um, for some reason about – 12 or 18 months ago, it just completely went away. Huh. But one of the strategies that I've found works for me personally is uh, you know, I don't put the headphones on or get in the zone or anything like that. I just try to keep my mind off of the mats until I step on the mats. So the commentating was good because I wasn't stewing in my own head in the back. You know, I was just watching those matches and focusing on, on something else until, like, I don't know, one match to, to go, and then I ran back there and threw my gear on and competed. So right. uh, that was helpful for me. Yeah, I think the you know how often how often would you say you compete? Because I've kind of you know I follow your Instagram and I feel like you're kind of constantly competing. Like, how frequently do you like to compete? Um, I like to compete a couple times a month if I can. Um, I'm doing mostly IBJF now, and I'm going to start adding some ADCC tournaments or the Abu Pro Trial qualifiers and all that. Um, since I'm doing those higher scale tournaments and they're they're more expensive and they're further away, yeah, it or well, maybe once a month now, but. Uh, once or twice a month would be great. I try to supplement that with, you know, super fights at closer tournaments and, you know, stuff like that. Yeah. I think the reps, I think you get in so many reps, like you're out there all the time. You're almost like you've gotten acclimated to that, that intensity level. I think that's a big thing for me was, you know, I don't compete that often. I try to compete, you know, as regularly as I can, but that's, that's the thing. I think you feel like, you've been there before and, and you know what to expect and you know, kind of, you, you yeah. I guess you have a, a knowledge of the unknown, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. You just like Elio said, you know, when, when you become comfortable in an uncomfortable situation and worst case scenario cease to exist. Yeah. So, uh, uh, well, it's like the positional swarm you're talking about. Put yourself in that bad position and stop sucking so much. <laughs> right. Right. So, um, tell me about commentary. Was there anything that uh, for you was, you thought was something difficult or easier? How did it? How did it feel? Did it feel natural to you to kind of talk about jujitsu? Because I, I know, like you and I are talking jujitsu and stuff, and it's like, but there's not right now. At least there's not all these people listening. You know, you're in the moment and they have to kind of break down the fight as it's happening. Yeah. Um, to be honest, it was probably a year and a half ago, so I don't remember. Nothing. Nothing jumps out at me, but. I teach jiu-jitsu full-time. I'm used to teaching seminars and stuff, and, and I, I enjoy speaking publicly. So nothing was difficult about it mm-hmm. for me. Um, and, you know, we both know jiu-jitsu pretty well, so it's easy for us to talk about that. Yeah. Uh, I, I enjoyed it. I'd love to do some more commentating. Um, it was a pretty good experience. Yeah, yeah. What was it like uh, competing at Fight to Win? Did you like that? I love the, you know, the... The environment was really cool. The show kind of—it was just really neat to to get that kind of um, production for a um, you know, jiu-jitsu match. It's awesome. Seth Seth Daniels really got something going on. Um, I've done different organizations like that. You know, the Respect, the JW Right the Song, which is a great show. The um, uh, Grappling Games Pro, and, mm-hmm. you know, down in the Nashville area. And out of all those that I've done, the Fight to Win Pro was you know was the highest quality production they've got. That's what they do professionally, you know. Mm-hmm. So they've got everything figured out from how to how to work the sound, and the, and the intro, to the commentation, and the rest, and, and the whole setup. So they've really got their act together, and of course the flow grappling too. It's really nice to have twenty thousand people watching the match. <laughs> so it was it was a bomb. 
Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, it, it was fun. Like, you know, Chewy competed, I think that's why we were down there, because Chewy competed on the same card. Um, Don Cobb, I right? thought, didn't he? Uh, maybe, yeah. I knew it was a bigger guy. It was a big dude. Yeah. He, he was just, you know. Chewy's one of those guys. He's He's got a match coming up. He's one of those guys, man. It's just, there's, I always say, there's levels to jiu-jitsu. And, um, yeah, I think you were at an open mat. I, I don't think I was... I was there, but I wasn't training. I think I had my kids with me or something. Uh, okay. But it was just, man, just watching. I think you and Chewie were going at it, and it was just fun to watch. It was fun to watch you guys. It's just levels, man. There's just freaking levels to jiu-jitsu, and you got brown belt. You know, shit, we've got some blue belts, and you're like, what? I mean, yeah. you think back. Like me personally, like I say this all the time, I think back, and I was like, there was no way I was at that level of blue belt. You know, oh, just, no. I think people are so much better. Like, I don't know if it's the exposure to more jujitsu. Like, there's tournaments pretty much every weekend, and there's all these techniques on, you know, available online and on YouTube. And uh, what do you think? Do you think that that maybe that's part of the quicker evolution of some of these people getting some of these jujitsu practitioners getting better faster? Absolutely. Um, I know. I, you know, I can empathize with you. When I look back, I think, man, I would get everything I've accomplished if I could go back to 15 years old and start over with what I know now. You know, like, not even just the jiu-jitsu knowledge, but just, like, telling myself, go train at this school and train this way. Right. You know, I would gladly do that in a heartbeat. But uh, it's because they, all those white belts and blue belts you're talking about, you know, have the benefit of, of all the lessons that took us years to learn. You right. know, uh, show them where the potholes are. And yeah. Don't go back. This way, and and the quality of training is so much better. The um, the accessibility, like you said, you got seminars, you got videos. I remember, I guess I was kind of the third generation of jiu jitsu. You got the first generations of like uh, the Gracies and uh, Mega Ten Diaz and those guys, and the second generation was like their their students. And that's like um, you know Jared, my instructor, and the guys I started with at Paducah. Uh, they were like those second generation yeah. American students, and I remember them talking about. You know, going five or six hours for a seminar because there was nothing around, or or these bootleg VHS tapes because yep. there were there was nothing online or, or, or DVDs or anything. And now you know we've got a dozen subscriptions of Keen Online, yeah, University of Jiu-Jitsu and Gracie Academy, and like you can pick your poison. Um, yeah, well, that's definitely a big part of it. And, I would, and, and, and art's just evolving, you know. Right. I mean, it's the last twenty years Jiu-Jitsu's gotten so much better. It's like you watch videos of like Alio and, and Carlos back in the 1950s and watch them rolling and then see what hoisted the UFC, it's completely different. Right. It's, or it's not completely different, but it's like a metamorphosis. And yeah. From from those early, you know, early 90s to now, it's like another 20 or 30 year metamorphosis and it's just leveling up. Yeah. I would, you know, you said something about going back, you know, 10 years. Shit, I'd go back. I was 27, no, 25 when I started. You know, wow. I'm like 34. Almost 35, so I'm like, man, I would have, to go back and be like 15 starting jiu-jitsu, shit. That would have been, <laughs> you're just starting, man. You're not even 25, are you 23? 25. 25. You're 22, you're just starting. Oh, no, I'm 26, man. I feel so fucking old right now. 26. Hey, this is the thing, man. You know, I you probably, this is the thing I tell people all the time. Like, when you start doing jiu-jitsu, especially when you're younger, you don't take time to take care of your body like you put miles miles on your body like and you could be 30 and your ass could be broken down you know it's just like i've seen it like dog years on the body yeah it's crazy it's crazy like i mean i'm like i talk to chewy all the time about it and, and chewy has done has put all this time into like his the taking care of his body and he hasn't you know knock on wood but he hasn't been injured in in a while you know he's got minor little tweaks but he consistently trains and before when i first started training in derby city and chewy was still doing some mma and stuff like that man he would get like injured all the time and like he's gotten older and he's gotten healthier he's gotten older and i think it's like one of those things that you know physical therapy and rehab and all that stuff it's not people don't really like that stuff until they need it and like yeah what they don't realize is that if you do preventative things like if you take care of your body, if you eat the right foods and, you know, you do the right, you know, strengthening and stretching and kind of the rehab stuff before you have an injury, it'll help prevent those things. And it's so much easier to stay healthy than it is to recover from an injury. 
Oh, for sure. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on you know, what, what prehab you recommend. I've just gotten into some heavier lifting, so I'm, you know, I'm in the gym more. And I'm trying to bulk up from lightweight to middleweight. Yeah. And uh, I try to stretch 20 minutes a day or so and, and just uh, eat healthy foods. You know, I, uh, I'm pretty much vegetarian. I eat, you know, like lean organic foods. But, uh, you know, if there's any particular regimens or, or things that you recommend that make pay big dividends in your journey, I'd love to hear them. Yeah, um, man, I think a lot of the stuff diet, you know, there's so many variations to diet. Uh, you, you're looking at, you know, some people think, well, vegetarian or vegan is the way to go. Some people think, you know, eat meat. And I think that there's not, you know, it just depends on what your body responds to. Like, if your exactly. body responds to better to eating meat, you eat meat. And if your body does not, then, you know, you do other things. The, then um, I think the load you put on your body, I always tell people there's like a load uh, – I guess like a load continue. You got to put the amount of load on your body. It's not going to cause it to break down. So there's a level to that. Um, and part of increasing load on your body or allowing your body to, you know, gradually be able to take more is strength training, which you're, you're doing. You know, I tell people all the time, like, you know, look at, look at our jujitsu, look at jujitsu posture, look at our posture, We're always rounded and closed in. It's always because everything's about, you know, protection, you know, protecting your, your neck and your shoulders and your legs. And so you're always in like kind of closed in. So that over time will cause some issues. So yeah, like people believe in yoga and that's great. Yoga is awesome. If you can do that and you like yoga, it's something to work in. But I definitely think, um, a solid warm up, you know, and more of a dynamic warm up with movement. So it might be sh certain stretches, like quick movement kind of stretches, not really holding for really long periods of time like shorter yeah. stretch times, kind of working into a, a position and then coming out of it. Doing that dynamically is really important. Um, and then, you know, on off days, making sure you do the right recovery things, like maybe stretching, you know, for longer periods of time, doing some deep breathing, meditation is huge for, you know, mental health and, and also physical health. Um, and then strength training is huge. Um, a lot of jujitsu practitioners don't believe in strength training. And I think like, you know, doing deadlift squats, um, you know, even bench press is okay. You know, rowing, those type of things, uh, pull ups, those are all great things to do. Um, because yeah. the stronger you are, you know, the stronger your, your joints, uh, you know, if you protect your joints, you know, not just relying on the ligaments, but maybe like the muscles around it to help protect and strengthen, you're going to be able to tolerate a little more, you know, abuse. Your body's going to be able to kind of really withstand a little more. So, yeah. I, yeah. I, I, it's valuing to hear that. You know, I, I agree with that for sure. I was on a similar journey with my like thought process about the strength training as I was about competition. When I the first five years that I spent in jiu jitsu, I basically wasted. You know, I wasn't in a very good training environment. I I, I had um, some different ideas about training and competing. That, you know, that I that didn't really help me along the way. That's why I switched schools when I kind of woke up to some of that. But hearing. You know, I always hear people say, well, you know, the technique is more important. You don't need to get your cardio better. You don't need to get stronger. You just need to get your technique better. And the technique is king for sure, yeah. you know. But if you take if you take one guy who's got 100% technique and then another guy who's got 75% technique but he's really powerful and great endurance, he's going to beat the tar of the other guy. He's going to wear him down and then dominate him. And, you know, I'd rather be stronger and better than just better, <laughs> you know. Well, you're not the, – the, the problem is this. The problem is you're not going into a jiu-jitsu match against somebody that doesn't know jiu-jitsu. Yeah. You know, you're, not going to, you're not going to a brown belt tournament or a brown belt level uh, tournament and you're competing against a white belt or somebody that just never competed in their life. You know, so that's when your levels are, are, are equal or close to equal. So the difference there is either strength, cardio, you know – uh, speed, timing, explosiveness, those things make a difference. You know, those are the things like, you, you know, I know people say, well, you shouldn't use your strength in jiu-jitsu. But man, when, when, when two people are equally, you know, similar size, similar build, uh, you know, similar level of technique, you know, then there's something that's going to make the difference. And a lot of times it's either cardio or strength or, uh, you know, those things. So I, I definitely think, you know, people don't, do some of these things, even like reha rehabilitative things like stretching and mobility work. Um, and I'm not saying everybody even needs to do that. Some people 
don't need to do that. And some of those people, the only one I can think of is Marcelo Garcia. He's the only one, you know, I've heard him yeah. say things. He's, and he's like, the, the way to get better at jiu-jitsu is to do jiu-jitsu. And that's all he does. Um, and I was like, that that's good for Marcelo Garcia, but he's one of a kind, you know. Yeah, he's the exception to the rule. Absolutely. I mean, you look at Hicks and Gracie or Andre Galdau or, you know, I mean, they're, they're, they're animals. Yep. They're, they're fit. Investments. Yeah. And there's a re- well, a perfect example. Uh, you know, you're, um, you know, Hoist Gracie. We talked about Hoist Gracie a little bit. When Hoist Gracie started, UFC one, two, three. Uh, you know, skinniest guy. Well, you looked nothing to look at. You know, one sixty, skinny. His gi almost looked like it was falling off of him. You know, he was that. He, he wasn't physically imposing, but he, you know, him and Ken Shamrock. You know, first I think it was the first UFC, and he choked him out. Uh, yeah. But then you go when Hoist was out of the game for a while and he came back and he fought Matt Hughes. Yeah. You're adding a guy that knows jiu-jitsu, maybe not as well as Hoist, but he knows jiu-jitsu well enough to negate some of that. And that's where you're talking about the 100% versus 75%. Yeah. But you and, got a guy and, he's good, and he's he's a hell of an athlete. Exactly. And, that, and it's just a recipe for disaster. Right, right. And, and so when you look at that situation, you're like, right. well... Else, it's just just talking about how you know how much of the attributes and athleticism do factor into the technique. I think they do. Yeah, people pick it up more. They they you know are are quicker to you know explode or respond or, or you know they can see things more quickly than some you know somebody that's maybe not as athletically gifted. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so yeah. you know I think strength training is great, and and, and um, you have to find the balance that your body is going to take because you know. If you train five to seven days a week, two a days and stuff, there's probably not a ton of time for your body to recover. You may even be better off like just taking rest days and doing active like recovery days. You know, that that's the thing because I, I almost you can break your body down and then you do more strength training that can break your body down a little more. So yeah, that, that yeah. that's something else. Yeah, it's important to remember. I think that you know your your rest days are part of your training. Hundred percent. For the longevity of your of your career, you're better off you're better off training five days a week for for the next ten years than you are going balls to the wall seven days a week for the next month until you get injured. Right, right. Well, because what you do is you can train consistently three to five days a week or whatever that is, or you can train really hard every day, and then get injured and be out for a month or two months, and then exactly. you get that decline. You have to build it back up. You have to take all that time to build your endurance and your timing and, and, and kind of your, your mom's muscle memory, get that back. I mean, I, yeah. I lose that. I even lose that if I don't come for a week or like a five days, you know, with my schedule, my schedule gets crazy. Like I'm like, I come back like today, I, I was my first time training for like five days cause I went out of town. And so, I mean the first, actually all the roles today, I was like me just trying to get my timing back, get my, you know, yeah. it's, so, it's, it's, Bill, for sure. You. Yeah, yeah. I mean, jiu-jitsu is one of those things that you got to, if you don't do it, you can think about it and keep yourself kind of in the game a little bit, you know, with your mind on it. But, man, your body's got to has got to go through the movements and the motion. So Yeah, because it's not really how sharp your mind is. You know, your, your thinking brain is too too slow for jiu-jitsu. It's got to be on that spinal column level. Right, you got to be, boom. Got to um, be the sharp. So what, what are you doing for, uh, like, so what's kind of, how many days do you train? And uh, what what kind of strength regimen are you are you doing, or what's worked for you? So I'm I'm pretty new to the whole strength training. Uh, it's one of those things I, I wish I started you know seven years ago, but I didn't. I, I've gotten into it here in 2018. Um, I just go to the gym and, and you know I lift. I, I do I do the basic lifts. I, I try to alternate every other day between squats and deadlifts, and then I'll build a workout around that. Um, do a lot of pulling and back. Not so much. I mean, I do all the body parts, but I don't focus a lot on, like, heavy pressing or heavy chest work. Um, and I try to uh, – more back, more pulling and pushing, and I try to emphasize whatever movement it is that I'm, I'm going to use in jiu-jitsu. You know, so, like, I'll do, um, I'll do some explosive ropes, like I'm trying to strip grips mm-hmm. or um, battle ropes, you know, the kind of movements that I'm going to use in jiu-jitsu. Um, that would be my, my strength training, and then I, I try to stretch – you know, four or five or six days a week for 15 or 20 minutes, 30 minutes. Um, 
in my training. I do. I try to get two hours a day of drilling and rolling, and then I'm also on the mat for several hours teaching every day. But uh, uh, teaching is, is definitely not training. It's a right. big difference. I think people look at us, you know, on the mats all the time, and they think, well, man, you get to train all day. Well, no, like, I can train one or two hours a day, you know, if I make time for it, and then I, mm. uh, the rest is just teaching. So I try to get, you know, like a morning drilling session. Mornings are, are a little lighter. We'll get up around 6.30, training for an hour or so. Mm-hmm. And then in the evenings, I'll go for um, maybe 90 minutes, two hours of drilling and rolling. And uh, try to do that. Five to six days a week, and Saturdays are my my uh, quote rest day, but that's when I travel and compete and whatnot. Mm-hmm. So sometimes I just need to block off a day and recover. If, you know, if it's been a, sure. uh, you know a long ten days, I've competed, I've traveled, I haven't gotten to rest, I might take a day off and just uh, I'll let my body have a, have a break. Have you had any injuries that you've dealt with in the past, or anything that you've uh, that you've had that kind of have, limited? I've had some uh, some pretty chronic shoulder issues. Um, I never had an MRI. I don't think I tore anything. It was just uh, my I don't think my lats were firing, and my infraspinatus was taking over for it, so it would get really sore. And uh, had some other shoulder issues from like always getting Americana or Kimura on one side in my lessons, be over and over on one side, and not. So one thing that really helped me with that was uh, um, doing just dead hangs for 60 seconds, five times a day or something like that, just letting that traction up on my mm-hmm. shoulders. Um, I'm a big uh, big fan of going to the chiropractor. My, my chiropractor is one of my students. He helps me a lot and, and helps keep my body in alignment. Um, I've had, I didn't tear, but I sprained my MCL. Mm-hmm. A single leg take down, um, little stuff like that. I've torn a, tick, uh, a ligament in my foot and uh, and one on my toe. But my most recent injury was in my foot. I, one of my training partners at IQ was going for a toe hold and it popped the ligament in my foot. Yeah. And then for the next four tournaments, I think it was Pans, Mexico City, um, the Rome Open, and then some other one. Like four in a row, they all went for toe holds on that foot. I don't know if I was like subconsciously leaving it out there or yeah. what. Uh, it was bizarre. Like they, spot on they, they all like honed in on that injury. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, th- yeah, and those like a lot of those are non-surgical. Like an MCL, usually uh, the, the blood supply is good enough to there as long as you do the recovery and, and strengthening. It usually um, it usually doesn't require surgery. And the same thing with you know the ligaments on the outside of the ankle. Those are. Most people walk around, if you ever sprained your ankle, you probably tore some of those ligaments and they just, they just, you know, they, they're torn and that's all there is to it. You don't have to do much to them. Uh, kind of just do again, that recover and get your motion back and build some strength around the ankle. And, um, that, yeah, that's huge. Cause people are always pulling on your foot. I'm actually yeah. dealing with one right now as well. Uh, on my right leg. So. Oh really? Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's just, you know, you'll get in, you'll, you'll feel pretty good. And then somebody pulls on a little bit or. Uh, yeah. and you'll, you'll notice it. It'll let you know. Um, so I, I wanted to know kind of how you made the transition, um, as far as like traveling and competing all over. When did you decide that jujitsu was kind of, um, what you wanted to do? You know, when was it the time that you were like, man, this is what I want to do. I want to compete for a living. I want to, I want to see the world in this way. I want to teach all over the world. How did that, how did that happen? So, um, when I was 15 is when I started training, and I, I was still in the Paducah school. Around um, around 18, or probably 17, a couple of years in, I, I got my blue belt, and I was helping with some of the kids' classes. And I remember just coming home one night and telling my parents, I think I, I, think I want to teach jiu-jitsu. And, uh, you know, it felt empowering. It was something I was good at. I'd never been good at anything else I was homeschooled and always mm. sucked at sports <laughs> and so I found jiu-jitsu I really enjoyed it and it was addicting and, and so I just felt like that's where I wanted to go when I was 18 my family left uh, Paducah and went back to Texas and so I, I had the choice to move with them and go to college or I could move out and try to teach jiu-jitsu and so I moved out I got an apartment um, was a broke 18 or maybe 19 old kid at that time I uh, Slept on the floor for a year and a half because I couldn't afford a bed. But I was like slowly building, you know, two private lessons and three private lessons, and, you know, little by little, um, 
growing up in Corinto. And so then around 19, 20 years old, I was, I wasn't competing a whole lot, but I was teaching full time mm -hmm. and, uh, teaching a lot and starting to cross train a little bit. And then I switched schools and, uh, I kind of reevaluated my, my teaching to training ratio. I, you know, I decided I wanted to compete more mm -hmm. and I realized I wasn't getting enough of my own that time because I was just trying to pay the bills and teach lessons. So I put the focus on how I could train better and, and, and um, maximize my potential as an athlete. So in the last two years, I really put the focus on competing. I started doing average GF. I uh, you know, started traveling a lot to compete. And so that mixes well with my other passion, which is traveling. We traveled a lot growing up, and I love to travel. I love seeing new places. I, you know, I want to visit every country in the world. So uh, being able to go somewhere and teach a seminar or, or combine a, you know, a tournament with a trip helps justify the cost and, and it's, they dovetail nicely. So those are kind of my dual passions and it's, it's cool being able to realize them both at once. So how do you set that up? Like, how are you setting up like, so you're teaching, saving up some money and then you're, you're traveling and you're doing some seminars or kind of how are you, like, what, what's your process of doing that? Sure. So probably the first thing I look at is the tournaments I want to do. Like, mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm trying to go to Tokyo in September for the Asian Open or the Asian Championships. Um, so sometimes when I have a day like that, I'll I'll post online that I'm going to be in this town or I'll have anyone that I might know and say, hey, I'm going to be in the area and you want to do a seminar. And sometimes I'll, you know, I'll get a bike back or maybe someone that wants to bring me in and I look for something, a tournament or a runner and say, hey, I can come. Mm -hmm. you know, this. Um, so I start coordinating between competing and teaching and then just hit up someone I know or make contact with the local schools and let them know my credentials and say I'm going to be in the area. Mm -hmm. And those seminars, uh, they, they don't always cover the expensive cost, but they offset it. And then um, uh, that that helps. Sure. Like, I'm leaving a week from tomorrow for London. And I'm, I'm doing the British Nationals and the German Nationals and teaching uh, a seminar in, in England and I think three seminars in Germany and then go to Switzerland for a little while and head back. And so I get to combine all that in one. That's awesome. What, what's the, you know, since you've kind of been multiple, multiple countries, and, and how do you feel like the level of jiu-jitsu compares, you know, um, you know, West Coast, obviously, you know, like California is like a hotbed, of course. Now we're getting, you know, New York, um, you know, Florida has got a lot of schools, stuff like that. Where do you, how do you feel like some of these other countries um, compare with the level of jiu-jitsu? Sure. Um, I would say, at least in my humble estimation, the U.S. is right behind Brazil as far as like the two, two leaders in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Um, clearly looking at the you know the World Championship results where like, it's only five Americans or U.S. that have ever won in the black belt. Brazil still has a stranglehold on on, um, on BJJ, but America's catching up. I think in another 10 years we'll have you know, a lot of, of U.S. champions. Um, Europe is a little behind America, but it's, it's not as big over there, but they have a really strong base in judo and wrestling in judo is huge in Europe. So the grappling level is pretty high. Jiu Jitsu is just a new kid on the block there. Sure. And Sambo, you know, all those, all those arts. But the guys that are in Jiu Jitsu in Europe, even if there aren't as many of them, the guys that are there are really tough. Um, and there's a lot of nogi in Europe, especially in Poland and, uh, a heavy leg lock emphasis. Yeah, yeah. What's um, the, who's the guy from uh, Poland? He's from Bellator, and he's done some. He's done Polaris, and oh god, I can't think of his name now. Uh, no, he he did fight for Bellator, and then he fought in the UFC recently. Uh, hmm, Poland, I'm not sure. Uh, Marcin Held. Okay. Marcin okay. Held. He's re yeah, he's like a big big leg lock guy. So is he really? Yeah, he's Polish. Yeah, he's one that the one that I could think of off the top of my head, but. There's a lot of guys that will come from wrestling into jiu-jitsu and they want to transition to MMA, so they do a lot of, uh, you know, most of their training is nogi sure. in Europe. And then uh, um, I've heard it, well, I've heard it, I've experienced <laughs> You know, that there's a heavy leg lock emphasis there, too. Yeah. Uh, you know, but there are some good schools, some good gi schools and good gi teams. Um, and it's it's growing so fast. You know, Hodger's headquarters are in London, so right. there's a lot of good jiu-jitsu everywhere. Yeah, he was fun. Uh, I, I saw him. I was, 
I saw him compete against, I can't think who it was now. Oh, man, the dude with the funny colored hair. Um, um, it was a... It was Rodrigo... A yeah, what's his name? Oh, Rodrigo, I can't think of his last name. I can't either. He's an OG. Yeah, yeah, him and Hodger went at it, and it was awesome. Wow. Yeah. So I'll, be at, I'll be at Hodger's school next week. That's awesome, dude. Yeah, he's wow. he's one of the guys, man, I, I've looked up to as well. I, I'd have to say, and we can kind of talk about that real quick, uh, you know, I, I'd say Hodger, you know, um, Marcel Garcia is probably one that I've looked up to. You know, he's just, I just love his, his style. And um, and we have Bernardo Faria. At, we he did a seminar with us. It's been a few years, and he was awesome. He was, he, he, he trained under, you know, he was with Marcelo for a while, tre- you know, teaching out there. And he was yeah. fun. He's a fun guy to watch. His style is kind of, he kind of calls it almost like old man jiu-jitsu, you know. He's, <laughs> up there. he's in his 30s, uh, or he just turned 30, but he was fun. He had a really heavy, heavy game, and he was fun. He's fun to watch. And so Yeah, I look up to, uh, to Marcelo Garcia a lot, you know. Not just for his jiu-jitsu, but because he's such a quality individual. Yeah. I think a lot of him. Um, do you know who, who the Valente brothers are? Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't I don't see eye to eye, you know, with their, their um, self-defense only views necessarily, but I, I look up to those guys a lot as, you know, for their character, their, their modern-day samurai. Right. And there's a lot to be said for that. Hickson's always been my yeah, jiu-jitsu. I, I've, I've never gotten to train them, but I really want to. And then Andre Galvao, I I can't say like his game necessarily speaks to me a lot, but um, it just his intensity and you know his leadership. He's he's a leader of his academy. Yeah. Uh, he and, and, and the Hibero brothers too. Um, I got to train at their academy a few weeks uh, ago. I think it was the week before Pans, and uh, and see them in action. You know, Worlds coaching last week, and they're uh, they're generals. You know, they have an yeah. army and they. They're good commanders. Yeah, they're, they always bring a ton of people. I remember Master Worlds, man. It was just a lot of because because I think uh, Shanji competed in mm-hmm. Master Worlds a couple years ago. I mean, he competes all the time still. Um, but yeah, they're they're just they have such big followings, such big teams, you know. Yeah. And then, uh, Lovato, I think, is kind of under them, and he's a stud too. Yeah, he is. So, um, is there? Uh, any places that you love to travel? Like, you have a favorite place that you like to go? Germany. Germany. Why is that? Germany. I'm German. Okay. Yeah, so I've got family over there. Okay. Uh, uh, like my second home. Um, I love going there. I love the country. If anything, if anything ever went out here, I'd move to Germany. Yeah. Um, it's it's my favorite place to be. I've got a lot of friends there. Um, and then Switzerland is a country that I always wanted to visit. I, you know what? It's the most beautiful place to me, and I've, I've never been there, so I always wanted to go. The Alps are, are my yeah. favorite place. I've been to Austria a few times, but never to Switzerland, so I took a week after German Nationals and uh, going down there into the, the Alps and just getting away from everything that awesome. I wanted, doing my thing. What's, uh, what's the drive, I mean, now, like, as far as competition goes? Is there a certain goal you want to achieve? Is there something, like, how have you done, and in, in, we can kind of – how have you done in some of these tournaments, and what's kind of the ultimate goal? Like, I mean, did you um, do you feel like you have good performances for the most part? How do you feel like you you know what's your goal to you know with constant competing? I mean, just is just win as many tournaments as you can, or um, well, the constantly competing is just like it's it's fun for me. You know, it's yeah. my hobby, so I compete because I enjoy it. But my my overarching goal is I'm going to win world at a brown belt. Um, uh, I feel. I feel like the game's made some really good developments in the last year and another year or two of that, and I feel like I can, um, you know, I can win. Uh, this was my first year doing Worlds, and I, I won my first match by submission. I lost my second match, but one of the guys, um, I, I fought a fellow named Rehan. He's a Marcelo Garcia brown belt. I fought him in Atlanta a couple of times, and we had some, some really close matches. Um, he ended up winning by points on a narrow margin both times. But I, I almost submitted him. You know, we, we went back and forth, and I lost like 11 13, I think. Oh, wow. Like that. And then he he lost to this year's world champion by one advantage. So, you know, kind of, I feel like another year of that, and I can, I can be on the podium. So that's my goal is to, to win worlds and then go to black belt and then do what I can do there. 
Yeah. So you feel like you're just right there on that level. Like, I mean, you're so close. Uh, um, I wouldn't say that. I mean, I, I've still got so much catch up work to do because I didn't, I didn't train hard to even train for competition until like, until I got my brown belt. So I've got so much catch up to do, man. It's not even funny, but I feel like I'm making good strides yeah. and, and, you know, you, you don't have to be better than someone to beat them. You just have to be better than them at one thing. You have to be able to pull them at that. Right. So I've got, I've got some, you know, some decent systems for what I'm good at. And, and I, you know, if I play my game smart, then, then I feel like I can beat guys that are better than me. Right. Just, well, yeah, that's that's a big thing. You know, I was, I was talking to somebody else about that. And a lot of jiu-jitsu is you don't have to be better than the person, but you have to get them into, also pull them into your world, your 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 area of expertise you know because not everybody's great everywhere you may yeah. be better you may be a you know even a blue belt great at leg locks better than some purple or brown belts and if you get them in that leg lock battle you know you can win so that's kind of th- that's the thing i think it's a it's a great point yeah but it seems like you know i i would say if you're training and competing against these guys that are high level you're constantly seeing that high level and you're going to figure out if you're at that level or not. It sounds like, you know, if you're close matches every time, even though you're not quite there or not able to get that victory, you're right there and it's close. And, and, and you know, and that's a great motivator too. Yeah, it'll, it'll come soon. Um, you know what the double ankle sweep is? From the close guard, you grab the ankles, push them over. Yeah, yeah. Um, everyone calls it something different, you know? I think it's like, a, oh, God. Lumberjack sweep, maybe, or something? Is that it? I haven't heard that one. Maybe. It's uh, like, yeah, you're, you're whole both, if they're standing up on you, is that correct? Yeah, you grab the ankles and push them over. Yes. So, we always call it the double ankle sweep. I flew to Rome and did the, the Rome Open. My buddy did the um, Nogi Europeans. Uh-huh. And, uh, my first match, I got a leg locker from, uh, from Finland. And I got him in my closed guard, went for the double ankle sweep, and he sat back and Went from ankle lock to knee bar to hold and tore my foot, oh, and it was like, like I spent twelve hundred bucks in a you know in a week in injury just to learn how to do that sort of leg locker, and it sucks, you know. Like I, I was upset, you know. It it doesn't feel good. No one likes losing, but it's like, man, I'm not gonna forget that lesson, you know. <laughs> right, right. I'm not gonna do that on leg locker anymore. It, it's seared into my mind. Right. No, I agree. And like you, you talk about like wasting, like you said, you, you brought, said this a couple of times, you said like you kind of wasted five years almost. I kind of disagree with that. And I think that if you didn't have that type of training or that experience, you wouldn't be doing what you're doing now. You may be less hungry or more yeah, complacent. You know what I mean? You're right. We're the culmination of everything that, that has brought us to where we are, you know, or, or everything that, that Everything we've been through is brought us to exactly where we are in this moment. And so it's hard to say, you know, I, just like it's hard to say, I wish I'd never dated that person or we weren't right through or whatever, because, you know, it it make it gives you the perspective you have now. Right. You you know what you don't want. You know where you don't want to be. Exactly. You know what it, what it feels like to go and travel and spend all this money and lose quickly. Uh, Yeah. You know, I've had, it helps you relate to the people that lose, you know? Yeah. I've got a, you know, I've got one of my one of my mentors, one of those guys that I was um, telling you that I cross trained with. His name is Andrew. And he's he was a four time world champion. He's a one of the best purple belts in the world, and he you know was way better than I am. He beats the tar out of me. But sometimes, you know, as amazing as he is, I you know I try to learn from every chance I get. But it feels like I have trouble relating to him because it's like you know what it's like to lose. <laughs> you know, do you know what it's like to struggle with this? And then I feel like with with guys that are way better than, than their, their peers because it's like can you really relate to what it's like to not be stronger than the other your opponent or better right. than your opponent or have to work hard yeah and, uh, it's such a man I hate losing I hate it and I've there's I've had a very it, we had like an in house tournament and I say this all the time and I lost very quickly in front of like everyone <laughs> and, and man, I literally couldn't sleep. Like I literally was like so embarrassed. I didn't want to. I didn't want to freaking look at jujitsu. I didn't want to have a shirt. Like I literally, we had like I had a um, like a Derby City shirt or jujitsu shirt. I wouldn't even put it on. I had went and found some other shirt because I, I was like, I don't want to wear this. I, I didn't feel like I was like I should. Like I didn't yeah. feel like I was uh, worthy to wear it. You know. 
Yeah. And, and there happened to be a, an ego tournament the next weekend. And I was like, and it kind of popped in my head. And, I, and because I went like two days without sleeping. Like, like I, I mean, I would sleep, but I wouldn't get that good sleep. I'd just constantly be on my mind and it would never at ease. My mind's always moving and going. And uh, I was like, I have to go compete. I have to try to do something to right the ship, you know, to uh, – because does time does heal some wounds. And I think it can. It can and kind of soften the blow a little bit over time. But I was like, I have to go. And so I went up and, I, you know, I, I did decent. I won a couple matches and, and kind of felt like I redeemed myself, so to speak. But, man, it was – it sucks to lose, but it is a great motivator, you know, because I went out there and I was like, I'm not freaking losing. You know, I, I, I refuse, you know. And yeah. it, it can it can make you sometimes a little less aggressive. It can make you want to win on points just because you want to get that W under your belt. Um, and I can't say that I did not do that. But uh, – <laughs> I, I I won one uh, by points and then I won one by submission, um, but it was just it was um, it was worth it. You know, it was uh, that that loss as much as it stings. I'll never forget it. Um, you, you know, it's what drives us. I think you know, losses drive us. Oh, well, absolutely. And I misspoke a moment ago. I didn't mean to take anything away from Andrew by, by saying that. The point I was making was that the the losses help us relate to other people that, that struggle, you know, for oh, sure. And, and talking about my training partner, you know, he's, he's a, he's a really hard worker and, and he's lost matches like everyone else. He's Absolutely. just a phenomenal athlete. And competitive. I, didn't, I didn't mean to take anything away from that. No, I don't think, I don't think, uh, I think we speak highly of people. Uh, there's no taking that, you know, yeah. Some people are, are more gifted for sure. Some people win more than others. Um, yeah. but the thing is jujitsu I always get a question like on injuries and jujitsu. Can I do jujitsu? You know, like you probably get, you know, people that are overweight or bullied or whatever, you know, 50 years old, whatever, every walk of life. And I think your answer is probably always the same. It's like, yes, jujitsu is for you. You can do jujitsu. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's going to be different for everyone. It depends on what you walk in the door looking for and, you know, what's brought you to this point. You know, some people have injuries or trauma that they can't do certain things or have to ease into it, but it's just that vehicle of self-development, you know, it finds you where you're at and takes you where you can be. Well, yeah, I agree. Like people always ask, well, if I have this injury, can I train? Can I compete? Or can I, can I be? Yes. You can do jujitsu in some capacity. If you see people with no arms, no legs doing jujitsu, you see people with these like congenitive, like congenital disorders, like they're born with birth defects. They're still competing and doing jujitsu. I mean, I'm not saying you're going to be a, a a world beater, you know, but you are going to be, most people aren't world beaters anyways, but you, you can yeah. get on the mats, get exercise, get movement, feel that, that special camaraderie that comes with jujitsu. You know, yeah. that, that's a big thing. Half, half my students at least, you know, have never competed and probably never want to. And that's fine. You know, like, like the students that want to compete will grind hard and will train for it. Students that don't want to, you know, you're still improving the quality of your life. You're going to have to defend yourself. You're losing weight. You're, you know, training circles around the people sitting on their couch. Yeah. And, you know, but by definition, by virtue of what it means to be a world champion or pants champion, almost no one can be. Right. Because there's only one, you know, there's only one brown belt middleweight world champion. And and then there's thousands of, of not brown belt world middle champions. And so that exclusivity is what makes people like me want it. And, and it's also what makes our soul you know, so uh, giving to everyone else because you don't have to be that one guy to enrich your life with what you just have to offer. It's, yeah. you know, like you said, it literally has something for everyone. And you get something out of it. Everybody gets something different out of it. Whether it's like, you know, getting away from the the work schedule, like or getting, you know, giving some freedom, letting your mind kind of focus on jitsu and not worry about other you know, other things, other other worries. You know, jiu-jitsu is one of those things that kind of when you're on the mats and kind of encompass you and, and, and kind of fill your mind with with people that you care about and, and technique and, and, you know, it's just different. And it, it kind of helps get away from, from a lot of the, you know, the daily grind, I think. And it's refreshing. Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah. Well, so what, what keeps you training? Me? Man, yeah. uh, you know, I started training um, 
I loved watching, you know, my dad, I remember, brought a VHS tape home, UFC 6. It was uh, Oleg Taktarov was on, and I think he was going against Tank Abbott. Um, and and I'm, I'm originally from Russia. So, oh. and I was, yeah, I was born in Russia and came to the States when I was six years old. And, um, you know, so we're like, yeah, Oleg, the Russian bear, you know. So, um, you know, we would watch the VHS, and we would watch Bruce Lee movies and all that stuff. And then, like, um, you know, then you see Hoist Gracie, and you start watching Hoist Gracie. And then um, I was just always interested in it. It always, like, it was something that intrigued me about jujitsu, and, and I did it, and I kind of didn't really like doing it as much. It was kind of something I just did. Um, and then it kind of became a part of me and it's something that like, um, it helps my mind. It helps my yeah. body, helps my mind. It, it, it like keeps me sane. Uh, it keeps me humble. It, it helps me be centered. You know, I think there's a lot, I don't know. Um, it's amazing. The feeling you get from jujitsu, you know, I say it all the time, the feeling you get after a hard day of training, like on a Saturday morning, you know, you do a morning class, and you come out, it's like 12, 30, 1 o'clock, and you feel like you've accomplished something. You know, yeah. I think a lot of it is, it's, it, I just love doing it. I enjoy it. I love doing it. I love learning. Um, I love staying active as kind of an athlete growing up. Um, and it's something I can do and continue to do. And hopefully my kids maybe will like it or, or, or try it out. And it'll give them something. Um, you know, yeah, I don't know if there's one answer, man. It's, it's a great question. But I just, I just love it. I love, you know, connecting with people as well. You know, being able to do a podcast like this and just like, just talk to somebody, you know, that you maybe can learn from or, or have a similar experience or a good experience, and um, it's just a great way to connect with people. Honestly. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome, man. That's good to hear. Thanks. Yeah. When I'm in, if you're interested, you were asking about the, the European um, jiu-jitsu scene. I'm teaching at camp um, at a school in Regensburg, Germany. I've been there several times. It's one of my favorite schools to visit anywhere in the world. And uh, it's, a, it's a man and woman, both brown belts. She's a brown belt world champion. And uh, they both compete all over the place. They run one of the biggest schools in Germany. And uh, they they would know more than I would about the, the culture of jiu-jitsu in Europe. If you want to do a, an event or, or um, a video while I'm over there, I can get them in and we can talk about Yeah, like a podcast with them or something? Yeah. That'd be awesome. Yeah. When are you going to be over there? Um, Germany will be the the first week of July. Okay. Yeah, let's set something up. Okay, awesome. I'll talk to them when I'm... Yeah, let um, me know. I'll set something up. Um, yeah, first week. That'd be, that'd be good. We can do okay. some... What's our time frame? What's our times? Uh, You're hours ahead of us. Say well, 10 hours? Five hours ahead of you. Oh, okay, cool. That's not bad. Awesome. Yeah, um... Clay, thank you. I appreciate it, man. We'll uh, we'll wrap it up. How can people get a hold of you if they want to follow you on social media? Um, if they want to maybe have you out for a seminar, what can they do to get a hold of you? Sure. So the best way to reach me would be on social media. Um, I'm on Facebook. It's Clay Mayfield. I'm on my private page, but it's, it's open publicly. And then I have a, a, an athlete page on Facebook as well. It's called BJJ World Traveler. And then I'm on Instagram under the same name, BJJ. So feel free to connect with me on, on all three of those and just uh, follow the journey, message me with any any questions, you know, about anything, whether it's diet, workout, jiu-jitsu training, um, hosting for a seminar or anything like that. I'd love to have anyone follow the journey and, and uh, help in any way that I can. That's awesome, man. Thank you. Uh, thanks for your time. If you have questions for me, please reach out as well. Um, any injury, um, rehab and stuff, I work a lot with, you know, uh, jiu-jitsu practitioners. As far okay. as helping with recovery and, and injuries and things like that, and um, so if you have questions, let me know. Uh, reach out; I'll be more than happy to help out as well. Okay, I appreciate that. Thank you so much for the opportunity, and I'll uh, I'll be in touch soon. Thanks, Clay. Appreciate your time, man. Thank you. Thanks so much to my guest, Clay Mayfield, for joining me on the podcast. If you want to follow his journey um, or reach out to him, uh, he's on social media at uh, BJJ underscore world underscore traveler. Um, thank you guys for tuning in. Thanks to my sponsor, Defense Soap. Uh, if you guys are in the Louisville area and have any questions or need some rehab, check out my website, proformrehab.com. I'd love to work with you all, help you guys out, recover, and get you back training. Also, if you guys love the podcast, please uh, do me a favor and uh, head to iTunes 
and leave a review. It means a lot. It would help me grow the podcast, um, and I would greatly appreciate it. And um, again, if you have any questions for me, you can reach out to me uh, at jujitsutherapist.com and follow me on Instagram and social media, uh, the Jujitsu Therapist. So, um, guys, thank you all so much for tuning in, and we'll see you next time for another podcast.